The Drum Candy Podcast is brought to you by Drum Factory Direct. Happy New Year, everyone. Welcome into Episode 7 of Season 5 of the Drum Candy Podcast. This is your host, Mike Dawson, coming to you from Drum Factor Direct in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. We are midway through this season, and I changed up the intro beat, but the intro beat is also from Simon Treasure. This time, he says, I want to layer lots of overdubs over a simple marching groove to create a cinematic feel. Simon used a 10-inch deep by 28-inch vintage Premier bass drum, a 10 by 14 Lud- Ludwig marching snare, and then various percussion items from Minel, Upcycle, and a 1970s Ludwig floor tom for the overdubs. Thank you, Simon, for two amazing intro beats to uh, be our theme song for this season. If you have an intro beat you want to be featured in the show, make sure you shoot it over to drumcandypodcast at gmail.com. I do need some more. But for now, let's get to it. Any of you in the Pittsburgh area on January 23rd from 6 to 9 p.m., we have our first Drums and Stuff Hang. It's a free event hosted by Drum Factory Direct and the Hawthorne Drum Shop. It'll be at Hawthorne Drum Shop in McKees Rocks, which is just north of downtown Pittsburgh. Also in partnership with this podcast and the Pennsylvania chapter of the Percussive Arts Society. So we'll have some giveaways. We'll have some merch, some new t-shirts if you want to pick one up. You can shop at the store as usual. Um, I'll be doing a drum tuning workshop from like 6.15 to 7, 7.15, something like that. And then 7.30 to 9, I'm going to hand it over to David Throckmorton, and he's going to give a clinic. So it'll be a good hang. Um, again, it's free. We'll have some pizza. We'll have some refreshments. It's just our we want to get something happening where just drummers get together and just hang out. So that's Drums and Stuff. That is January 23rd, 6 to 9 p.m. Check the Drum Factory Direct Facebook page for the event. Also, the Hawthorne Drum Shop is uh, they have the event page there as well. And on my personal page, RSPP, if you can make it so we know how much space to clear. And I look forward to seeing you there. That's January 23rd, 6 to 9 at Hawthorne Drum Shop. That is the Drums and Stuff Hang with David Throckmorton and myself. This episode features the first half of my interview with the great Gregory Hutchinson. Greg has been at the forefront of the modern jazz movement for the past 30 plus years. I saw him back in the day with the Joshua Redman Quartet. I believe they were supporting the record Beyond. Been a huge fan of his ever since. He's played with who's who of everybody in modern jazz. He just recently put out his first record as a leader called The Bang which is not a traditional quote-unquote jazz record. It's more of a club club music with some hip-hop influences and groove and electronic, and there's some improvisation, all that weaved into one, collaborating with some great artists, including Kareem Riggins, Kurt, Kurt Rosenwinkel, Vernon Reed, Christian Scott, um, some more, uh, Nicholas Payton, many others. Really interesting listens. Go, te- go check out The Bang. He's also an educator, online educator, teaches privately, so we talk about that. We talk a little bit about everything, so let's get to it with... The first half of my talk with Gregory Hutchinson. How's Um, life as a touring musician in 2023? uh, Life is good, man. Um, You know, it's of course we we we've gotten through what it was, the pandemic and everything. But um, for me, I needed a little break, so that was kind of nice. And it's back to you know, kind of back to normal. It's always hard trying to to juggle work and having some time off and and family and all that stuff and especially now with a new project feels like i need to be trying to to work even more to gear towards that and not side man stuff but really focusing on that and that's where the challenge comes that's a new career right there yeah how do you make that without i mean how do you how do you navigate that because you've been working decades to build up your side man <laughs> yep. situation that's that's a good hey, cut, get get at me in about two years and i'll have an answer for you <laughs> <laughs> don't you know it's i was just talking to someone about that today i really don't know it's like uh you're going into a whole nother side of 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 the business and especially with the music that i chose to do it's a whole nother genre so it's not like i'm go- i'm staying in jazz and and trying to, to bring a band out that way no i'm going into something that's totally different and so it's re- it's you know it's interesting um it'll be a challenge but i'm up for it what do you see the new project turning into as far as a performance because it's a heavily produced record what does it become when you put it on stage oh it's the same thing it's it's that and with the live with the live element um all the music stays the same but it's it's a looser environment but we still we it's called the bang we still bang that same way you know it's it's a consistent like oh my god hit you harder and harder each tune you know and that's the feeling we want it's like 
So imagine you go to see your favorite band, U2, or I'm not comparing myself to that, but like U2 or Earth, Wind & Fire or, or just bands that give great live shows, uh, Steely Dan, you know, and um, Frankie Beverly and Mays, you know, any any group that you've seen that, that give a great live show, that's what it's going to be. And that just comes from knowing how to be an entertainer, you know. Um, that's, the, that's the real side of the music. Can you entertain people? Mm. Now, does it does how much of the production gets incorporated, or is it all going to be performed? All, it's all, it's all, yeah, I run I run stuff through Ableton, but even all the musicians I use, we we can play all the stuff live. But nice, all the little nuances that I might need if I, I'm not taking out twenty people on the road, so all those little nuances are are running in the back. But we're still we're still we're still there, and I use the Roland. Um, thank you, Roland, and for. Uh, in being able to endorse their products. So I, I bring all the triggers with me. So this drums sound like the drums on the record, you know, and that's mm. really the big, you feel that, that bass drum pounding. It's like, oof, wow. And you hear, you hear the layers of bass drums that I have sampled into the one bass drum that you're hearing. Then you're like, oh shit. Okay. Excuse my French. Now, do you already have a band together or is it still kind of coming together? Yeah, I have a band. I have a European band and a, and a U.S. band. The U.S. band will pr pretty much be the guys that were on the record. Uh, Ray Angry, Earl Burness, myself. Um, and I have two great singers, uh, Lisa Lotte Osterblum and Leona Berlin. Cy Smith is on the record. So in terms of that part, uh, I'm still figuring that out. But the European band is all guys from the U.K. Uh, David Mirko, Rick Leon, Femi Ottavino, uh, Let's see, Lisa Lotte and uh, Leona Berlin, yeah. Now, what is your gear for this band? Oh, that's great. So <laughs> that's been the great. So it's 22 by 16. Uh, it can be 22 by 16, two floor times, 14 and 16, run, and then running all the triggers and everything I need. Or it can be 22 by 16, uh, 10, 12, uh, 13, 14, and 16, which it might be the full set as I, I, I just grew up that way and I just want to get back to playing some big drums mm. with all the triggers, um, Pisces cymbals, and all the effects. Um, yeah, so I'm looking forward to it, man. It's going to be a lot of fun, but it doesn't, you know, the whole thing is it's, it's music that can be played with a scaled down drum set or with a big drum set. So, is your cymbal set up? stay kind of jazzy or are you going no, 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 no. So we, we keep the 20 we keep the 22 inch ride um then the crashes are like uh 16 17 18 and 20 crashes um some effects symbols uh all peisty a little peisty bell i'm trying to get that peisty gong out on the road but that's a little too, <laughs> that's a little too big right <laughs> <laughs> um some effects hi-hats and then normal 14s so yeah, Are you it's scary? fun. You know, it's like kind of experimenting. Like I, when I went to rehearse, I just used the bass drum, snare drum, and two floor toms, and did everything that way, and triggered all the all the stuff I needed to trigger. Uh, SPDX pad, of course, mm -hmm. and uh, and did everything that way. So I, you know, I have to think. As drummers, we endorse drum companies. I endorse Pearl. And my girlfriend said to me, why do you endorse drum com a drum company when you never take the drums on the road anymore? And she's kind of right. Like, we don't take drums on the road anymore, but it's nice knowing that you can get the sound that you want on the road. So that's, that's good. Um, I kind of miss taking my own drums on the road. But hopefully, when the band gets that big and in 30 years, <laughs> if yeah, people yeah. are still touring, I can have a roadie and, and we can take the drums on the road and do all that good stuff. Man, when's the last time you took your own kit on the road? Yeah. Early night, uh, early two thousands, playing with Joshua Redman. Nice. Was that like yeah, full? That, that, like you had a a, a drum tech well, and everything. A drum set. That was like an eighteen, um, twelve, and fourteen, and cymbals and hardware. So that's a little easier to do. Yeah. But you you taking a bigger set and all this stuff. That's what I'm saying. Like, yeah, the good thing about the triggers are like I can take all the triggers, um, the SPD pad, and basically I have every. I could do the whole show with just that. I can do mm -hmm. a whole show with just the SPD pad and um two of the, the two of the kick two of the kick pedals are rolling and that would be the whole thing. But who wants to go to the show and see that? Like that would that doesn't really I want to hear the damn drums. That's what I play. I play the drums. I want to hear the drums, you know. So you spent 
so many years developing your finesse and, and low dynamic playing. Did mm-hmm. it take a while to bring back the, the, the harder hitting or is it just there? No, it's always there. I mean, the, the, it's harder to play soft. <laughs> right. Right. That, that, you know, I learned that from Betty Carter, like play playing soft with intensity, but also at the same time when you need to amp it up, you can always amp it up. So that's, that's the fun part. It's like, you just have to understand when, when that's needed, and even when you're playing, you know, harder music, the the trick is not playing super hard. The, the harder you hit the drums, it doesn't make the drums sound better. The, the harder you hit the drums, it actually makes them sound worse. So bringing that touch out of the of, out of the tom or or the snare, it's, it's still that finesse, you know. It's still knowing the sweet spot on the drum and how to hit it. Yes, yeah, I think the misconception is as you play hard, louder music, you got to hit harder. No, you just have to know where to hit and and how to hit the drum. That's it. And the tuning, I assume, changes a bunch. Yeah, yeah. We, we we don't have the the super, not super high, but we don't have that the Max Roach or or Philly Joe tuning. We're we're more like uh, Steve Jordan. We're more like you know down there. The, the bass drum is is open, uh, but still low and open, so that oof, you you feel the bass drum. You know, I'm not really into a lot of pillows in the bass drum and all that. No, we use the right head combinations, and you tune the drums the right way. So that when you hit that bass drum, you still get boom. So that way, when you want to get those tones, when I want to press in a little harder on the head, I can still raise the pitch of the bass drum. And the toms, yeah, the toms are tuned differently also. A little lower range, but not, not uh, it's, it's kind of like, I think you have to experiment and find what works. For this music, there's not a lot of tom playing on it. So like I say on Instagram, flurries don't bang in the club. <laughs> Flurries are just for drum, like for us to just have, like that's just some drum shit, drummers. But really, when you when people are dancing, they do not want to hear that guy, that guy, that guy, that that shit is great for for other drummers. But in a club, you would never you would never hear that in a strip club. Strippers would not dance to flurries. <laughs> There's a quote of the day. <laughs> that's I'm, I might have to make that. I might have to get that one copyrighted. Flurries don't bang in the club and strippers don't dance to flurries. <laughs> true, right? When's the last time you were in a club and you heard like, have you heard that on the Steely Dan record? Have you heard that on the Earth, Wind & Fire record? Have you heard that on any any pop record? Chris Brown, anybody? No, you don't hear that shit. The producer be like, ah, stop, 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 stop. Now, let's, let's address that as the drummer on your own record. Did you have to edit yourself? No. Nope. Listening back? I knew exactly, I knew exactly what I was going for. And some, you know, a lot of stuff I played and then I went back and chopped up in the MPC or chopped it in Ableton, chopped it with Roland. So I knew exactly what I was going for. It was the boom bap. Like I grew up with that and that's the sound I was looking for on this. This wasn't about, you know, let me see if I can play the slickest feel going into the, no, 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 no. This, this play just keep the continuity of the music and keep the heads moving like this. That's all. That's all you need to do is move your head like this. The whole album. So let's talk about the origin of the bang. What mm-hmm. what sparked you to go down this path for this record? You could have done a jazz record. You could have done a feature. You know, a drum album. Why this this approach? The challenge. The challenge. Everybody knows I could have done that, right? That's the easy way out. And I can always do that, and it'll be killing. I have so many great friends that I can call: Brad Meldow, Christian McBride, Joshua Redman, all Ruben Rogers, all all these great friends of mine that I can call and do a record like that. That's easy. The hard part is going into a different genre of music and showing that music is just music. Like I first learned to play music, which wasn't jazz. My family comes from the Caribbean, so I grew up playing. Reggae, one drops. That's what I, I grew up playing that. I didn't know anything about Elvin or till my mother played me Elvin one day and I said, Oh, oh, what's that? Like at first I said, eh. And then second, and then later I said, Oh. So it went for eh. To, oh shit, what is he doing? So we're musicians, right? When you when you first learn to play the drums, you don't say I'm a I'm a jazz drummer or I'm this. You just say I play drums. I'm I am a drummer. I am a musician. That's all I want to be known as. I don't want to be known as a great jazz drummer. I want to be known as a great musician and great drummer. And so the challenge is going into a different genre and proving yourself. And I, I think I've done that, actually. 
how did you write this material? Was it lyrically <laughs> driven? Was it drum? I mean, where did it where did it start? It started for me going through a divorce. Mm. And um and being real with myself and my flaws as a human being, my flaws as a father, um, sitting in a park every day for about six or seven hours because I didn't want to be around my ex. Um who we, you know, up until recently, we were actually really still great friends, but sometimes you need to give people space. But um, I just sat and wrote not music. I just wrote my feelings and my thoughts and all the things that I had done wrong and the things I had done right and how I was feeling as a man, like so vulnerable in another country by myself, dealing with all this shit that was on my head. And then I went back and I was like, I had already gotten the record deal, by the way. So I had no idea what my album was going to be. Like if it, if it this didn't happen, it probably would have been a jazz record. But I went back and I just said, man, you know what? Let me look at this. And I the funny thing is, like we as people of rhythm, we often write in rhythm too. Like we address one emotion and we finish that, and we start dealing with another emotion. Then when you look at it, you're like, oh wait a minute, this has a a pocket all of its own. So like my depression, my feeling sad about. Uh, uh, being a failure and had going through a divorce, that was one pocket. And then I realized, man, you're not a failure because you're going through a divorce with my second divorce. First one, I was super young, but you're not a failure. Actually, what, what are you learning from this? And then the, the next step was, okay, well, you're going to be all right. You know? And then the next step was, okay, so let's make everybody all right. Why, why do, why do we have to hate each other? Why do we have to be upset each other, at each other? And then the next step was like, Oh no, let's make some money. <laughs> <So> <laughs> I'm serious though, man. Think about it. Like we all go through shit every day. Music is, music is, is the same way. Music is a dealing with a lot of emotions and a lot of stuff. And sometimes people don't really deal with like, what does it feel like to like, you know, be on the road by yourself for, so I've been on the road for over 30 years mm -hmm. by myself. So I grew as a man on the road with other men, young men. And, you know, of course there's pitfalls to that shit and people don't talk about it. The women, the drugs, and, and yeah, you say drugs, oh, you guys are a different generation. Yeah, that shit is still out there. You know, luckily I never fell into anything too hard, but it's still out there. And so you have to you kind of have to maneuver your way through all of those things and yet have a consistency of the music where on, even on my worst day, I'm still better than 90% of everyone else, but that doesn't matter because that's just in my mind. I'll never tell you. And I joke around on Instagram. I say, yeah, you know, but in my head, it's not about anybody else, but myself. Mm. That's, that's the long. Answer. Yeah. Yeah. How do you maintain your, your, your crispness when you're on the road so much, when you're away from the shed or whatever, do you, Oh, the shed stays all it's, it's I haven't even unpacked yet because I'm in Paris. I'm trying to make sure there was no bed bugs around, but <laughs> I pads. So one, I want to shout out my guy who made this puck pad, which is the most incredible. I gotta show you this shit. The most incredible invention. It's actually a hockey puck, right? That's a pad. And this is a French uh is he from is he French or is he let's see, hold on, I'll tell you in a minute. I think he's French actually. So this is killing, man. Check this out. Oh, sweet. Yeah. It is a puck. And, yeah. <laughs> right. I told him, I saw him the other day in Switzerland. I said, man, you know, back in the day when I was young and in high school, we used to use these pucks for different things. <laughs> <laughs> and and in, in the hood, we didn't play hockey. So this, 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 <laughs> right? let's keep it 100%. But the great thing about it is, you know, you tie it. And I gave him some ideas. I say, hey, man, you know, if you redo it with a strap, it's a lot hipper. But all you do, this is what I usually do all day. So this is what you see. This is. Mm. And I just sit here one hand at a time or sometimes both. And I just sit here and work on, work on, you know, fingers, wrist, fingers, wrist, and then go through and going through all the rudiments. So usually I drive my neighbors in the hotel crazy. I just took a break today. <laughs> What about like like bigger conceptual things? Are you still are you still shedding like new ideas and new phrasing, new vocabulary? Yeah, I'm trying. That's what the whole is so funny. And we talk about flurries. And I was talking to Eric Moore the other day, who's a good friend of mine. And I was saying, man, you know, what if Elvin played popular music? All the stuff that you guys are doing, that's what he would be doing, but it would be different. 
it would be it would have accents in different places. It would have not the same phrases that are prolonged over three or four measures. It would be something different. So I'm thinking like that, but I'm not trying to do that because that's what they're doing. So I want to do something different. So it's like I'm in the shed constantly trying to figure this out, but it has to be musical. Like mm -hmm. so for the music I'm playing, it's really like, okay, what's the hip phrase to go from the chorus to the bridge or or you know, finding these little things and groove is groove. Like I've always been a fan of groove, but all my good friends, Chris Dave, all these great drummers, I don't want to play groove like they play groove because they've already done that. I want something different. Mm. So how bass drum and snare drum. That's the that's the basis for where we where we move the crowd, right? Well, consistency and knowing how to manipulate the hi hat, not only with placement, but also with velocity and volume same thing with the bass drum you know so how do you do that and so i'm always thinking about that as well as what are the concepts of jazz that i can bring into the other side of music but not playing like a jazz drummer so i hate that it has to be authentic you can't be a guy who plays jazz trying to play pocket and it sounds that way that to me that's the worst or like a guy who plays pocket trying to swing no we won't be authentic so if you're gonna play Cuban music, you gotta know the clave two three three two. You gotta know how to do that, right? You gonna play Brazilian music, you gotta you gotta understand how to play samba. So you need to take your ass to Salvador Bahia or to Rio to understand how to play that stuff, right? Okay, so that's kind of my my approach to it. It's like I'm shedding all the time, but I'm listening to young cats and hearing what they're playing and understanding. And there's three ways, you know. There's a, when I teach, I always say you have to listen, learn steal, copy, forget, mm. change. Because mm. if you don't do any one of those things, you end up sounding like the other person. So we don't want that. We want to sound like ourselves. So those are the things that you have to do. How far do you have to go in each of those steps before you can change it? Oh, until you understand what it is, really. I think that's every every person would be different. So for instance, in jazz, I understood early, you know, the concepts of Blakey, uh, A.T., because I, I hung out with those guys. Mm -hmm. I got to sit next to Elvin. I got to sit next to Tony. I got to talk with those guys. Tony was a great friend. So understanding the person will lead you to understanding their concept. You don't have to understand how they play. Understand the person first and then change, you know. And once you feel you've got it, then then you you can go ahead and, and and start to manipulate it and change it around you know so i, I tell all the young guys do that they say man i want to play like you no don't play like me please play better than me like I, why would you want to copy me you can take elements of me but don't do that man because then there's no need for you mm -hmm. why should they hire you which is a version of me when they can hire me no bring your version of what you think i am and who you are live your life through the music not my life that's great. <clears throat> you touched on something I wanted to talk about, which was mentorship and actually getting to know the people, your heroes as people versus just listening to the record. And yeah. how, in your experience, listening to Elvin on record versus seeing Elvin in the room and talking to him, list, like how does it change your conception of what they're actually doing, the truth behind it? Mind-blowing. <laughs> the record is mind-blowing, but then sitting there listening to the sound, it's like this pulse of energy that you're getting and everything you've heard, you're watching it happen live, but which, which you don't get from the record and what you get from sitting in front is the pulse of energy that's hitting you and the sweat coming off of Elvin hitting you in the face. You know, same thing with Tony. I should sit next to Tony at the Vanguard, man. Those drums sounded so now see people say loud. No, no, man. That shit was power. That was the most power I've ever, I've never heard anyone, anyone play that powerful. No one. I've sat next to all the greats. Tony had a way of hitting the cymbals or or just his whole ritual warm-up that he would go through before he started playing. That shit was amazing. So the feeling of sitting next to these great players and seeing it done live and watching, oh, you say, oh, I thought that was this, but it's actually this. Mm -hmm. You get to, you know, like, and, and feel it. And if you can't feel it, it, it's not the same. And I feel sorry for a lot of younger guys coming up now because they haven't had that chance to see those greats. All right, Blakey, 
when he couldn't hear. But yet you're like, how the hell is he still in time? And he like he lost his hearing. You're like, wow. Or Vanel Fournier, you know, sitting down having a drink with Vanel Fournier talking about brushes. You know, like this is incredible. Like, you know, so I think that's the difference is like getting to witness it live and feel the presence. And also more than more than drumming, though, actually getting to know the person, like I said before, is so is so crucial because that is really how you learn where they like where they came from, what their concepts came from. How did you grow up, man? Like I asked Elvin, how'd you grow up? But man, how you know, hey Greg, man, you know, I came up, it was the times it was really different, man. You had to really play, man. You cats got lucky. You know, and same thing with Blakey. So my Elvin and Blakey voice are a little similar. Blakey would be a little deeper. Ah, you know, ah, well, I went to Africa and I came, you know, it's like, wow, tell me about all of that. And and the evolution of the men and women, too. You know, we can't forget about Cindy, uh, uh, Terry Lynn, you know. So it's like I grew up hanging out with those ladies. You know, I met Terry Lynn in my house one day and I didn't even know she was staying there. Mm. I came downstairs and she's just there walking around. Well, like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> the story gets deeper, but I can't go into it. <laughs> I was like, "Oh shit, Terry!" She's like, "Hatch, what's up?" I'm like, uh, uh, "If I know you were here, I'd put some clothes on." <laughs> she's like, oh, don't don't worry about it. <laughs> now, do you feel a bit of responsibility yourself to be that for the young guys coming up? You you're kind of at the prime age now to really yeah. be the mentor. Yep. And I, I always felt that even from a younger age, we have to pass it on and and pass it down and make sure that it's understood, you know, just how important this, I, I like to call it, um, I guess if we were in college, it would be a, a sorority or whatever you want to call it. But this is a, this is a, a collective of, of people around the world who do what you do and you have to take it very seriously, but you have to understand the lineage of it and really like, so it's up to me and others who are older than me, KWs, Kenny Washington, the Marvin Smitty Smiths, the Jeff Tane Watts, the Jim Keltners, all these great drummers to share this knowledge. Dave Weckl, you know, who I know is a friend, Vinny, who I, Vinny, man, I used to see Vinny all, all day like this on the road. Like I'm at breakfast at eight in the morning. Vinny's like, how's what's up, man? <laughs> hey man. I'm like, God, man, I feel bad. So, but it's up to us to pass on this 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 knowledge that we have so that the next generation can be different, can approach the music differently. I feel that's what's missing. It's like, and that's why things sound the same because they don't have all of the knowledge. They have a little, little speck of it, which makes them all kind of sound the same way. Where is the difference between like a Steve Jordan and a James Gadsden or a James Bradley Jr., you know, all these great drummers or Steve Gadsden, like you can tell each, or, or Dennis, you can tell each one of their groups or Omar, each one of them, you know, or Billy, each one is so different. And that's what we need. You know, I don't need to close my eyes and hear and be trying to figure out, man, who, who is that? Mm. Wait, I think, no, well, no, still flurries. Okay, well, wait, <laughs> who is it? You know, I don't know who it is, you know. But when you close your eyes and you hear Omar, you know it's Omar, you know it's Dennis, you know it's Steve Jordan, you know it's Steve Gadd, you know it's Vinny, you know it's Billy Cobbman, right? Yeah. If I any one of those songs or any one of those drummers, even now, you would say, okay, that I know who that is. I just went down the... Uh, even Stevie uh, Wonder. Yeah, true. So... Man, there's so much to follow up with that. What do you think is missing? I mean, it's almost ironic because now we have so much accessibility to everything. We have every record in our pocket. That's the problem. So what, you're not, not spending enough time with each piece, like each thing? It's, I mean, you, yes, you answered the question. So <laughs> there, there were record stores, right? And there, there was the ability, before there was iTunes and all this stuff, if I wanted to hear a record, I had to save up the money to buy that record. Say if it was a very rare Art Blakey record or whoever. And maybe that record cost eighty dollars. You know, I'm in high school, so shit. That's I gotta <laughs> save up. When I got that record, like Love Supreme, man, my mother hid the original copy of Love Supreme she had and made me go save up money to buy another copy, only to for when I got home to give me the original copy. Nice. Is, <laughs> but I played that record until I wore it out. Then I know why she hid it because I wore it out and I had the other copy. But guess what? I can tell you everything on that album that that's being played. So 
sometimes accessibility to everything is not a good thing, you know, and, and if you're going to have access to everything, you have to know how to process everything, take things in slowly and damn, be original, like uh, be original. That's what do you all. do with your students to kind of push them down that way? Do they have to be at a certain point in their development or is it incorporated all no, right I away? People who don't even know how to how to hold a damn drumstick and, and give me. I always tell them, man, I got a three month plan. So for people who never played before, OK, we, we give them a little more time. That takes about a year to get them in the ballpark. But for people who have played the instrument three months, discipline, discipline, discipline. If you if you have a routine and you follow that routine every day or every other day, guess what? You'll get better. Mm -hmm. But don't practice the same shit every day. No. Challenge yourself. Don't practice the same tempo every day. If you learn something, then bump it up a couple of notches. See if you can still play it at a different tempo. And then put yourself in different situations with what you're trying to learn. If you practice the way that you're going to play, then you learn faster. So a lot of guys practice in the practice room, but then when it comes to the gig, they're scared to do what they practice. No, I put you in, I put you in a situation and say, okay, cool. Now let's just take, for instance, I'll give you something. You, you, you got a drum there. I'll tell you how to do this. You take three rudiments, right? Check this out. Now you don't have to look at Wilcoxon to do this. Three rudiments. Let's say you played a, a five stroke row, a seven stroke row and a paradiddle, right? One, one, one. Now we're going to put the accent on the first beat of each rudiment. And then what we're going to do is we're going to move those accents back by one beat each time. So the first, the, the five strokes, the accent is going to be on one. But that seven stroke, we're going to move the accent to the second beat. And then the paradiddle, we're going to move the accent to the third beat. And we just keep moving each one down, 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 down. Okay, after you've done that, then you play it backwards. Mm. Now, when you check it out when you get a chance to see what happens. See what you come up with. Then what we do is now we say we take all of those accents and we put those. So just to play it on the snare drum is not going to do it. That's not going to be enough. No. So this is where you come up with different combinations. So we take those accents and we put the accents first on different drums. First, we move the accents on different drums. Then we start to move the right and the left on different drums also. So if you have an accent that's right, well, maybe that accent on the right is going to be on a different drum also. And then if you do that, you start to hear how you can come up with different different ways of, of playing the drum set. And then also not seeing the drum set from snare drum, tom, tom, tom. Everybody sees it this way. No, I, I teach like this. Mm. So every hand and every limb has to be able to do what this hand, this has to be able to do what this hand can do, this has to be able to do what this hand can do, and vice versa. So you see the drums this way. And so when you're playing... You, if it, if you start to play something at any moment, you can be here or back under or back like this. You see, so it's like tai chi on drums. We will wrap up that conversation next week, but for now, let's change over to a lesson. This is part three of Odd Time Fluency series. This time, we are talking about adding flams and drags and other ornamentations to our four plus four plus six series of exercises that we covered back in lesson number one. So here's our lesson. Welcome into part three of our series on odd time fluency with 16th notes. This is another hands lesson. This time we're going to take our basic patterns of four plus four plus six and six plus four plus four and four plus six plus six. And we're going to apply different rudiments and substitutions for the accents and the taps. Just a quick review. We're in seven, eight, which means we have 14 16th notes to work with, which is why I grouped them into four four and six, and the sixes are gonna actually be played as two groups of three. It's a very common way to play seven, eight. So here's just the basic pattern, accenting the start of each grouping. So it'll be four, four, three, three, uh. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Okay, that's our, our basic framework. So we're gonna play, instead of playing accents, we're gonna replace those accents first with double strokes. Four, five, six, seven, one, two, three, four. This time we're going to do the opposite. So we're going to play the accents and then double stroke everything that is unaccented. Four, five, six, seven, one, two, three, 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 four
This time we're going to add a flam to all the accents. Four, five, six, seven. One, two, three. All right, this next one's pretty tricky. We're going to do flam drags for every accent. So you play a flam on the accent and then you drag the next note. Four, five, six, seven. So now we have a flam with a double followed by a double. That's called a flam five. Four, five, six, seven. So that was with the right hand leading. Let's do the same thing, four plus four plus six, but starting with the left. So here's just the basic structure. Five, six, seven, one, two, three, four. Now here it is with diddles on the accents. This time diddle the unaccented notes. Here it is with flams. Five, six, seven, one, two, three. Flam drags. And the flam five. five six, seven. Okay, now let's reverse the order. So instead of it being four plus four plus six, we're gonna start with the six. So it'll be six plus four plus four, starting with just the skeleton. Now diddling the accents. Five, six, seven, one, two, three. Diddle in the unaccented notes. Five, six, seven. With flams. Five, six, seven. Flam drags. Five, six, seven. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And flam fives. Five, six, seven. Let's do those variations starting with the left. So six plus four plus four. Here's the basic structure. Five, six, seven. One, two, three. Diddles. Diddling the unaccented notes, which is considered tap rolls. Five, six, seven. Flams. Five, six, seven. One, two, three. Flam drags. And flam fives. Five, six, seven. All right, we have one more variation. So now we are four plus six plus four. Again, here's the skeleton starting with the right hand. Five, six, seven. Two, 
didn't lean the accents. Five, six, seven. <laughs> Tap rolls. Five, six, seven, one, two, three, four, five, seven, seven, four, five, six, seven, Flam fives. Five, six, seven. And you guessed it, starting with the left hand, the basic skeleton. Five, six, seven. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Here's with diddles. Five, six, seven. One, two, three, four. Tap rolls. Five, six, seven. Flams. Five, six, seven. Flam drags. Five, six, seven. And finally, flam fives. Five, six, seven. So this is a great way to, you know, reinforce these different groupings and really work on some dexterity, though some of those flam rudiments can be really tricky. What I do is I just cycle through them all in a row. Um, when you get to the flams, you might have to skip a diddle to get the flam started, or maybe not flam the first note to get into the flam section. But just try to cycle them all, maybe like four times each, till you get to the end. Uh, make sure you pick a tempo that you can play the flam fives comfortably. Those are really kind of tricky if you've never done those before. And there's also anything else you can do, 30 second notes, you can do all sorts of subdivisions for the things you do, buzz rolls. But that's just one basic overview on how I like to use a structure of accent patterns and then substitute different rudiments and stickings um, to give you a good warm-up exercise. So have fun with it, and we'll see you next time. Let's answer a couple of your listener questions. By the way, if you have any questions for the show, email me, drumcandypodcast at gmail.com. Questions about anything, gear-related, educational, music, career, whatever it may be. Again, drumcandypodcast at gmail.com. Hit me up. This question comes from Tom. Um, I've heard you talk about the trick throw-off as being your favorite one. I currently use the DW mag throw-off with a three-position butt plate. Am I missing something? How is the trick better? Any bit benefits of one over the other? Uh, benefits of one over the other? I don't think so. They're both really good quality, durable, um, very stable throw-offs. My experience with the DW mag is the three positions are a little bit too extreme. So it goes, it can go from like really loose to really tight. Um, it gets, it's just too wide for me. Whereas the trick, I feel like I can control, you know, what I like to be the loosest possible tension is one setting, the middle section, and then the third setting ends up being exactly as tight as I want it to be. So I just like the, the range of tension better from the trick throw off, but they're both great. You really can't go wrong with either one. And this one is from Alex. Do certain heads or collars work better for certain bearing edges? Great question. And yes, it's something we probably don't think about enough is the thickness of the flesh hoop, which is where the drumhead film connects to, the metal ring, and the shape of that collar can really be affected, can really affect how well the drumhead sits on the bearing edge depending on the shape and size of those bearing edges. Um, old vintage roundover shells, Sometimes the the more extreme collars on some of these drum heads, because um, they're all different. Evans, Remo, Aquarian, Attack, they're all different. Sometimes they just don't seat right. So you kind of got to match your, you got to experiment. I mean, if you have an old vintage drum that's that's 
like kind of out of round or like oversized or something, um, I would recommend checking out the Remo Classic Fit or the Aquarian American Vintage. Those are designed to seat better on those old shells. Um, the only issue I've had with, with new quote-unquote drums is my Premier Signia kit from the 90s is undersized. And the way that the Evans collar is shaped, it, it can actually slip under the hoop um, because of the shell being undersized. So that's the only issue I've ever had. Otherwise, all the new heads fit pretty much any new drum. So be aware of vintage drums and maybe some that are slightly undersized and how that collar might fit. The point is, you want the bearing edge to sit on the flat part of the film. If it's touching the curvature of the collar, you're never going to get a proper seating. So, yes, they do make a difference. I think you just have to experiment with your drums and different models and makes of drum heads and see what seats the best. So once again, shoot your questions over to drumcandypodcast at gmail.com and we will get them answered in a future episode. Now it's time for our warehouse pick of the week. We have some really good quality, incredibly cheap DFD 5A practice sticks. These are they're high quality premium hickory. They have a standard 16 inch um, length, 5A diameter, um, acorn tip. They are great. We would call them practice sticks because they're not perfectly balanced. They're not going to be pitch perfect. There might be some discrepancies in just the way the grain looks. But I've used these here for practicing in the studio, and they're good quality sticks. The biggest thing is they are $3.99 a pair. So if you need just some, some cheap but good sticks, they're not banana sticks like you would get out of a, a, a bin at Guitar Center or something, um, go check them out. The model number is DFD-P5A. Again, that's the DFD 5A practice sticks, $3.99 a pair. Go check them out. Happy New Year, everybody. Thanks for tuning in. Again, if you haven't already, or if you don't mind doing it again, give us a five-star rating. Drop us a written review in iTunes or Spotify, wherever you get your podcast. Go over to YouTube. Make sure you subscribe. Hit us with a comment. Let us know what you think of the show. You can always uh, reach out at drumkennypodcast at gmail.com. We appreciate you listening, and we will see you next week.